All right, so let's talk about the life cycle of a machine learning project. Um, so typically, you know, you'll, like any project, you start off in a planning phase. Um, and so for pose estimation, this would include things like, you know, how do we know that we should even work on pose estimation at all? You know, what should our goals for the project be and how do we pick, um, how do we decide how many resources we need to complete it successfully? Once you have a plan, then you'll typically move into a data collection phase. Um, this is really important in machine learning projects. And uh, for pose estimation, you know, this would be things like, we need to figure out what objects we're gonna train on. And then we need to set up our sensors, like our cameras, and capture images of objects, and then somehow figure out how to annotate those images with ground truth. Right? So for each image, we need a, um, a, a ground truth estimate of the position and orientation of the objects so we can use that to train our machine learning system. I think one important um, point about the life cycle of machine learning projects is that it's not really a linear flow. Like at each step, you can iterate back to the previous steps. So for example, if you know, we go through this data collection phase and then we realize, you know, actually for this problem, it's just gonna be too hard for us to get data. Or um, maybe we realize that actually um, it's not hard for us to get data, but it's very hard for us to label the data. Um, then you might actually go back into the project planning phase and say like, okay, let's rethink whether we can, um, uh, whether we can set up this project in a better way. Once you have some data that you've collected and labeled, then you move into the training and debugging phase. Um, and so this, would, this has activities like, you know, maybe we start with uh, just a linear regression as a baseline or some baseline in OpenCV. And then we might do a literature review and say, okay, what is the state of the art really in pose estimation? We might implement those models, um, reproduce them and debug them and see how well it performs on our task. And then we go through this process of continually improving our model until we get to the point where we think that we're hitting the requirements. Um, now, there are a lot of reasons that we could loop back into data, data collection. I think um, a lot of times we'll realize that we're overfitting, right? So in order to meet our requirements, we need, um, a certain, we need to hit a certain performance. And um, it might be the case that in order to hit that performance, we need a big model. And that big model tends to overfit if we have a small data set. So we might need to go back and collect more data. Or we might realize that our data um, is actually, the labeling was unreliable, and so it's causing our model to produce garbage results. We could also realize that the task itself maybe is just too hard. Like maybe we didn't think about um, some things that make this actually infeasible. And one of those things could be, um, you know, if we have multiple dueling requirements, right? So we have um, an accuracy requirement and we have, say, a performance requirement, like this needs to happen in real time those things could trade off with each other. And we might realize that there's no way to actually make them both true at the same time. So once we have our model um, and we're comfortable with, our, with its performance on the data that we've collected so far, then we actually go and deploy it into production. And um, you know, I think this usually happens in stages, right? So for our hypothetical robotics company, maybe we would just try to pilot it in the lab and you know, make sure that before we send it to customers, that it's actually doing what we think it's supposed to do. Um, and in this phase, we're also gonna be running a lot of tests to make sure that if performance degrades in production, then we're able to catch it quickly. Um, and then finally, kind of once we've done a lot of test writing and, um, uh, and, and trying the model out ourselves, then we'll actually go and deploy it into production and see how it performs. Um, but I think what's very common here is that we'll find out, um, you know, hey, actually, the performance of our model in production is not as good as we thought it was um, from the data that we have already collected. And so we'll actually go back to that training phase. We might find out that you know, when we collected our data, we made some assumptions about the distribution of objects, let's say. But in reality, those assumptions don't hold true. And so we might realize that um, our data distribution itself was actually wrong. And so we might need to go back and collect more data for, um, for you know, things that are underrepresented in our training set or cases that are hard for our model to perform well on. And then, you know, finally, I think another really common thing that happens at this step is, you know, we've picked a single metric for our project and we've been driving that number down, but then when we deploy things into production, we realize that, you know, hey, actually, even though our model is performing really well according to, you know, accuracy or something like that, it's not actually driving, you know, downstream user behavior, right? Like the, the end goal of the, of the model in production is not being met. Um, and so you might go back and revisit what's the right metric to optimize for this model. 
Okay, so this is kind of how I would think about all of the activities that are happening for a single machine learning project, but there are a few enabling things also that you kind of need as an organization to make projects successful. Um, you know, one is how do you set up your team and how do you make sure that you're hiring great people? And then another is how do you make sure that, um, you know, that you have infrastructure and tooling that's allowing your team to move fast? A few other things that I think are important to doing machine learning projects successfully. Um, one is you just need an understanding of what is the state of the art in your domain. And so this is just to give you a sense of um, how do you know what's actually possible to do, right? How do you know what's a, uh, an easy problem and what's you know, a problem that you need a research team in five years to solve? And this also will give you ideas for what to try next. And so our, the last um, sort of main lecture of the course is going to be Peter talking about um, kind of the landscape of research and where are the most promising areas that you might want to investigate. Okay, and this is just, this is all this in one place, this, the, the life cycle of a machine learning project. All right, I'll pause here and take maybe three or four minutes for questions, if there are any. All right, first question. What, is, what do you mean by baseline? Yeah, so we'll talk in more detail about um, what I mean by baseline, but essentially a baseline is a, um, a number that you know should be achievable. And this will tell you um, whether your, the absolute performance of your model is good or not. Another question is, this is a question about having a framework for maintaining the models that are deployed in production. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll talk about deploying models into production um, tomorrow. There is a question that says, why do you only look at the state of the art in the training phase and not the planning phase? That's a good question. I think you definitely um, should look at the state of the art in the planning phase as well. Um, I think this, this will come down to, you know, how do you assess whether your project is really feasible or not? And um, I'll talk about that a little bit more in a few minutes. What is the best way to review the state of the art for a new project, uh, given that your team may not be experts? Yeah. Um, I don't have, a, I don't have like a silver bullet here. I think I can tell you a little bit about my process when I'm trying to review state of the art in a new field. Um, I think typically what I'll do is I'll try to find, um, you know, I'll try to find like one or two impressive kind of like landmark results in that area. Um, so if, you know, if I, were, if I was looking at robotics, then um, I would look at, you know, a lot of the results from Peter's lab or from OpenAI or from Google Brain, um, where they've had kind of impressive high profile results. And then the question is, how do you go deeper from that? And so usually what I'll do is I'll look at, um, you know, I'll look at the papers that I'm most impressed by, and then I'll just look at who they cite. Um, and so I'll follow that tree back. Um, so if, if, there are, if there are like kind of components of their research that are, you know, that are particularly important um, that they're building on, then usually you can find those in their citations. And then I'll also follow the tree the other direction, right? So if there's like a, uh, a landmark paper from 2016 or 2017, right? That's like, in deep learning years, that's like 20 years, right? Um, and so you can look at all the papers that cite that paper as well. And, um, you know, if there are many, then you can just sort of sort by which ones um, themselves have the most citations. And then you, that'll give you a sense of how people are building on top of their work. So it's about following the citation tree, or at least that's my approach. There's several questions about metrics, so can you- Yeah, I'll, I'll just, um, let's take questions about metrics when I talk about metrics. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how do you effectively communicate challenges of ML projects to upper management who have not been practicing the field? Yeah, this is a, this is a great question. Um, <laughs> I'd actually love to open that one up to the audience. Has anyone been able to do this particularly successfully? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe just rules to solve business problems, uh, but in that so in that way uh, there was a solution just to like do um, automatic onboarding for some careers. Yeah. Uh, so in the process, I was like, hey, we have to be careful with this. So why not include like a neural network? What is that? What is about that? Like, just like really smooth and slightly just just mix with the business case. You have to like know how this solution, deep learning solution, can mix with the rule-based solution, but mm -hmm. just try it from there on and then keep pushing up 
um, the efforts until they see they, this works, this currently works. Then from that point on, uh, just start with something simple that could maybe in a classification problem or something that they can see, yeah. oh, this is magic. So I was showing it to the co-founders and they was like, oh, well, that's really cool. And, uh, but just start small, but yeah. that's it. Like, yeah, I think I like that. I think um, that gets at a couple of the points that I think are important. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about this this afternoon in the Teams lecture as well. Um, but I think it's, so I think like if you, if you ask yourself why is it that um, it's often so hard to communicate um, effectively about machine learning projects to people in, in management. Um, I think it comes down to a few things. One is that, um, but the, I think probably the main one is that uh, machine learning projects and engineering projects don't really follow the same um, life cycle, right? So in an engineering project, typically you can kind of plan out, um, all right, here are the things that we need to do and here's how they build on top of each other. Here's how long each one will take to build and here are our dependencies. And so we can build a map of um, everything that we need to do in order to solve this problem. But it, in machine learning, um, you know, you never really know what's going to work and what's not going to work, right? So it requires a very different mindset. Um, and so I think that's kind of one of the main challenges that you have to communicate. And I think one thing that I've seen be really successful in terms of like convincing leadership that they should be taking machine learning more seriously is to find places where you can um, get quick wins uh, using ML and, you know, find a project that'll take six months, let's say, where you can sort of demonstrate, hey, we're on the track to doing. We're on track to do something here that could be um, could have a huge impact on our business. 